Greetings, everyone. Welcome. My name is Andy Herndon, and you are listening to the Play for Keeps podcast, an initiative of the Ashland New Plays Festival in Ashland, Oregon. Here at Play for Keeps, we are recording compelling new plays with world-class actors and sharing them here with you on our podcast, making theater accessible worldwide and on demand. We have created this series of podcasts to let you in on the front lines of new works for stage. Today, you'll be hearing part two of Dance of the Fluxons by Drew Katzman. Be sure to listen to last week's podcast to hear part one. Our recording features Cameron Davis as Kent, Elizabeth Goodenrath as Millie, Scott Kaiser as David, Megan Nealon as Rainbow, and Stephanie Potter as Francine, with stage direction by Jim Pagliasoni. Now, without any further ado, part two of Dance of the Fluxons by Drew Katzman. Scene three. A little while later, appetizers have been served. David at the table is texting. Rainbow and Kent sit on the couch eating appetizers. Millie stands near the bar, finishing and refilling her wine. Francine enters down the stairs. Her makeup is a little streaked from crying. His gun's still there, so no worry with that. His what? The gun in his room? I got worried for a sec that... I I mean, his old room... Though he doesn't really have a room in our apartment. They're like, all both our rooms there. What gun? To Kent, as she sits and munches an appetizer. He had a little office where he had his gaming stuff, which was kind of his room, but we made that the baby's room. I guess the baby has his own room, even though he's not here yet. (laughs) But Andy and I share the others as equals, except... Andy has his own chair, though, in the living room, just like you, David. Anyway, so, the gun is in his old room. Andy has a gun? Just one here. An actual gun that shoots bullets? Yeah, that kind. I would know if there was a gun in this house. Taking another appetizer. It's strapped up under the right side of his bed, his old bed, in this kind of uh, duct tape holster he made. He's so clever, isn't he? (laughs) He said it would be good to leave it here just in case, and that it wouldn't be a problem because you'd never find it. I guess he was right, huh? Just in case of what? I'm freaked. How do you think I feel? He's got seven at our house. What? I know, exactly. What do you need seven guns for? One for each of us should have been plenty, right? And maybe a shotgun. And a rifle, I guess, just in case. In case of what? Of course, we need the one stashed in the flower pot by the front door. And we have to hold on to the AK-47 because the Constitution says so. And he looks so sexy when he puts on that pearl handle Colt 45 in his cowboy hat and boots. (laughs) especially when that's all he's wearing. So, I guess seven is good. And that's my lucky number. So, yeah, great. (laughs) Seven. In case of what, Franny? Whatever, I guess. I don't completely understand, but he's smarter than me. When did he get this gun? When he was in 10th grade. It was when he was getting into the red kitty all the time with his fake ID. I was serving his drinks one night and he showed it to me. The gun, I mean. And that's around when we fell in love. (laughs) Kent, he was so tall. And with that mustache and the gun, I thought he was like 21 or 30. (laughs) Does he seem shorter lately? I'm totally freaked. Right? He seems shorter, doesn't he? It's not loaded, though, right? He keeps the ones at home loaded, so I would think so. You know, just in case. David, did you know about this? I did not know about this. I counted all the ones at home when I was back there, and the one here is still here, so, you know. Do you think we should be calling the police or anything? I mean, what with aliens and all that? Franny, he's fine. Let's, for argument's sake, assume that's true. Great. Good. Thank you. That means he's not here because he's being a rude and belligerent little shit. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And you indulge it for reasons that are known only to God. Hey, that's what you could ask God the next time we play the game, Millie. I'm not indulging him. We're not waiting for him. We're going to eat as soon as I'm done with this. You realize we're ruining Rainbow's entire evening? I'm cool. 
We can wait a little more. I thought you wanted to go to Patty's. It's the same kids I see every day. It's fine. I'm sorry, David. Sauerkraut and salsa on celery doesn't quite cut it. They're so cute. Just like little baby hot dogs with green buns. You know what? I'm going to eat. Anyone want to join? Don't you touch that food. Excuse me? What else do you do in parlors, Kent? We're going to sit down for a meal together as a family. How about I get us all some cheese and crackers? Would that be all right, dear daddy? I guess. Want to come, Kent? Cool. Cheese and cracker SWAT team. Anybody want anything else? I just don't want anyone losing their appetite. Rainbow and Kent exit to kitchen. And you think it's okay to talk to me like that in front of company because... And you think it's okay to call our son a shit in front of company because... Because he's a vengeful little turd. You have done this to him his whole life. I've done what to him his whole life? You know exactly what I mean. Oh, you don't even know what you mean. Francine starts to hum as Millie and David keep the argument going. I don't know what I mean. That's exactly what I'm talking about. What are you talking about, David? Go ahead. Tell me what you're talking about. If you have something to say, say it. I have nothing to say. <laughs> Surprise. You do it to him. You do it to Rainbow. You do it to me. Great. As soon as he gets here, the three of you can gang up on me as usual. Don't start your more victimized than thou routine. My what? I'm sorry that was beside the point. I'll start whatever I damn well feel like starting. Fine. I'll start whatever you deserve to have me start whenever I damn well feel like starting it. Do you even hear yourself? I hear myself perfectly. Do you? I don't think so. You don't think I hear you? That's what I think. You want to attack the way I think? Oh, my God. There's no end to it, is there? You're looking for an end to it? Is that what you want? You want an end to it? Rainbow and Kent enter with a tray of crackers and cheese. Snack patrol. We nuked some brie for you, Mom. All eat. Francine returns to her seat. Let me at least take out a couple of those butterflies. Okay, if you think so. David... Maybe Andy's at one of those meetings like you have, and like you, he won't make it for dinner at all. Those are work-related meetings, aren't they? Today is his day off. Maybe he's following in his old man's footsteps and working on his day off. Maybe so. Maybe he's got an important meeting with some hot little number in accounting. Or would it be the vice president of marketing? Is that who you're meeting with tomorrow? I don't think Andy would even know anybody like that, so it's all good. Don't believe me, you never know who they know. I, I'm pretty sure that's not where he is. You may think you know who they are when you marry them, but you haven't got a clue what they'll do after that. It's just that I don't think he's at a meeting because he got fired yesterday. Oops. What? Oh, Andy. When were you planning to tell us this? He kind of wanted to tell you himself. Don't tell him I told you. What did he do this time? It was really beautiful today, wasn't it? I mean, except for the rain and the hail. David, you knew about this, didn't you? I did not. You just told me you spoke to him yesterday. I did speak to him yesterday, and he didn't say anything about it. I thought he told you everything. I thought you guys were such tight buds. Uh, I guess he was trying to sort it out for himself before talking about it. He asked me not to say anything. Should I have said something? I should have, huh? I don't know. I promised. That was some hail this afternoon. <laughs> hey, hey, I've got a game. What was the weather like on your birthday when you were seven? What did he do? I'll go first. I remember really well because I wanted a mermaid party. And me and my mom spent like days cutting out all these crepe paper fish and like a ton of blue and green crepe paper stripes to look like the ocean, you know? Have you seen the ocean for real, Kent? I grew up pretty close to it. Wow. Okay, so... Even though you've seen the ocean for real, if you had been on our patio, you would have said, I'm underwater. How am I going to breathe? <laughs> That's how real it was. My mother is a crepe paper artist. Well, you know that, Millie, from the wedding. <laughs> and the night before the party, I went to sleep so excited that I couldn't even sleep. <laughs> Except I must have, because the next thing I knew... I got woke up by a big, humongous thunder and rain pounding on my window, and I ran downstairs, and everything was soaking wet on the patio floor. Oh my god, that so sucks. That must have been so sad. Yeah, it kind of sucked. 
but it didn't. You know why? Why? Because, like Mama said, all the little fishies got to be in the water on my birthday. So it all came out okay. <laughs> yeah, great. Except for only two girls came to the party. That was the weather on my seventh birthday. Who's next? Why was he fired? Kent, you ever heard of Brain Angel? Good bear song. Millie pours herself some wine. They're a local group that is awesomeness incarnate. Come listen on my computer and be baptized. Sweet. Rainbow and Kent head to the stairs. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to play some music for Kent while we wait. No, you're not. I'm being a good host like you wanted me to be. We'll come down as soon as Andy gets here. Help your father get that thing done. This is a... I have to do this part myself. Let her go listen to music, Millie. Bring down my iPad when you come back down, honey. It's on my nightstand. Sure, Dad. She is going nowhere until we all go to the table. I'll try calling him again. Pulls oh. out cell phone to call. Oh, wait. I have his phone. You have his phone? He... Well, it's out of battery, so it doesn't matter too much, actually, really, accordingly. Attempting to break the tension. Do you guys ever play Why? <laughs> What's with the games, Kent? Let's go listen to Brain Angel. You can bring your computer down here. What's why? Kent moves back to his seat. Oh, man, it is totally fun. If I bring my computer down, can we go downstairs and listen in the rec room? No one goes into the rec room until the floor is done. Still trying to ease the room. No, seriously. You have to check this out. So someone asks why something about something that's, like, generally part of life. And then we all make up answers that are true, but they're not the right answer. You know, like something like, like... Why is the sky blue? Why is the sky blue? Because puce would have clashed with the vegetation. Have you played this before? How about the sky is blue because it's not brown? Excellent, Franny. That, that, that's a perfect answer. Thank you, Kent. Except sometimes it is brown, huh? Really? Well, like in Beijing, right? Pouring herself more wine. How about why do we destroy ourselves? He said something that's generally part of life. And self-destruction isn't? I think maybe you're overextending a personal issue. Mm, that's what you think, huh? Let's go listen to music. David so enjoys psychophilosophical pondering. It's really pseudo-delightful. How about why would someone break a whole bunch of dishes this afternoon? I mean, in general, not like this afternoon. Why, why would someone break a whole bunch of dishes? Franny? It's no biggie. They were kind of ugly anyway. <laughs> My mother has this thing for owls. Are you okay? Oh, yeah. He left right afterwards, and I cleaned it all up and everything. <laughs> this is a fun game. Who's next? How about why are we not at the dinner table? How about why don't you have another drink? How about why don't you fuck off? Millie rises, momentarily loses her balance, then drifts toward the bar and then the front of the stage. Maybe he's shopping for new dishes, and the lines are really long, and he's just waiting, 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 and he can't call, but he's thinking about us. To the audience. I cannot remember love. How can that be? I knew once, I think. But maybe that was my imagination, or a song. Thirst describes the need for water. Hunger describes the need for food. Why is there no word that describes the need for love when so many people are dying of it? To the room. I'm going upstairs to circulate my chi. Millie exits up the stairs. Daddy, can we please go listen to music? Franny, if he's been using, you need to tell me. He hasn't, I swear. Has he been drinking? No, he has not. I don't think... He loves the baby. He's not drinking. Kent, how about why are there stoplights? Good one, Franny. Well, what's going on? I think he... What? I think it's, you know, to come over here for him sometimes is not so easy. They were stupid at work. And the dishes were stupid. Wait till you meet him, Kent. He is a beautiful man. And he has a beautiful heart. Like, a really beautiful heart. I think you're going to like him as much as I do. Well, 
I mean, I don't think you'll get pregnant or anything like that, but, <laughs> well, you know what I mean. And he can tell you all kinds of things about town. You know, like shortcuts and the best cheesesteak and, you know, just, like, just things. Like, let's say you were, like, studying really late and then you just had to go play basketball. He could tell you where to go. And then, where to go get a tamale when you're done. <laughs> Even if it was four in the morning. That's the kind of guy he is. And he would tell you. He wouldn't keep it to himself like some people would. He's like a genius. And he writes apps on the computer, like for little kids and stuff, and they're so sweet. <laughs> and he calls me baby and takes care of me. But I take care of him too, you know. So, it's not like we're codependent <laughs> Or anything like that. It's just like I, I just love him and he loves me, you know. And I mean, I think even more than Coney and Tiffany love each other. <laughs> and I know he really wants to be here and meet you. And I'm sure he's going to be here soon because he's hardly ever late anywhere anymore because I've been working with him on it. Except today was just... Today was not too great a day. He's not doing anything bad, okay? He's not. He loves me and the baby, and he's not doing anything bad. <laughs> I have to... Francine exits to the bathroom. Franny, I'm coming with... Rainbow exits, following Franny. Andy went through some stuff a few years ago, and... You ever get into drugs at all, Kent? No, sir. If it weren't for Franny, I don't know if he would have made it. Wow. Our culture tends to raise up those who are already standing. You know what? We we should eat. I'll, I'll help you finish. Oh, there's nothing to finish. I, I know this thing like the back of my hand. Oh. I was thinking if he got to spend time with you, Kent, you know, just starting out, trying to figure out what courses to take, all that stuff. I thought it might. So I... Uh, I'm sorry. Stuff like that has nothing to do with you. We, we should eat, and, and I should get you on your way. Rainbow and Francine enter. David takes out his phone to look at a number and dial. Kent works on finishing the last of the cheese and crackers. Come on, Kent. Let's check out Brain Angel. Franny's going to come with. Wow, you really are hungry, huh? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm starvationing. <laughs> hey, Elaine. David Braylock, hey, uh, has Andy been in there at all today? Okay, thanks. Starvationing would be a good word for it. David ends the call and starts texting. Franny, you starvationing? We're still a few minutes out. Uh, I've got to reheat a couple of things I turned off. Uh, honey, go ahead and bring a few more things out to snack on while I get the meal back on track. You starvationing, Franny? Do you mind if I go watch Entertainment Hollywood? Careful of the baby. Don't tell Millie, okay? Go. I need to know what happened with Coney and Tiffany this afternoon. I sure wish he'd leave her. Francine exits to the TV room. David continues texting. Hang on, Kent. Rainbow exits to kitchen. We hear cabinets opening and closing, bottles clanking. Kent sits alone, a little lost. TV noise is heard faintly in the background throughout the following. You need any help? David finishes texting and makes a call. Danny, uh, forget the meeting tomorrow. It's not going to happen. No, it's done. We'll meet Monday. Enjoy the time with the family. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. David shuts his phone and exits to the kitchen just as Rainbow enters from the kitchen with a platter. Pull a model apart as soon as you're done with that. Okay, Rainbow? Brown rice crackers, almond butter, carob syrup, veginase, carrots, pickles, and sun-dried tomatoes. No ketchup? What was I thinking? <laughs> I can't bring food upstairs, so let's chow down here and then go listen. You did the hunting and gathering. I'll prepare the meal. Close your eyes. Don't do anything gross, okay? He sets about preparing something for her. I'm a Republican, remember? We don't do gross things. Unless you're married. Oh, low blow. You married? Um, dang. 
You know, I left my wife in the car. What was I thinking? Yeah, I know how it is. I have husbands on three continents, but I choose to live with my parents because they are the only people in the world who truly understand me. How could you not? Dating? Nah. <laughs> you know, you? Nah. You really went door to door to raise money? I did. What's the dealio, dude? You don't walk like a duck or talk like a duck. What do you say we send the border patrols home for the rest of the night? If we do that, how will we know if we're worthy to breathe the same air? We could just accept our parents' opinions and agree that we're both lower forms of life and leave it at that. <laughs> Your parents give you shit too, huh? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm. I mean, they're okay. So they're okay, but yes, they give you shit too. You almost done with that thing? Open up. He feeds her. Oh my god! Oh my god! Let's see a carrot, carob syrup, sun dried tomato. Very good. It's surprisingly not repulsive. Something else though. Hmm. I uh, I dip the carrot in pickle juice before I put on the the other stuff. A stroke of brilliance. I aspire to Iron Chef. Are you a carnivore? Well, bamboo chef. Vegetationer, really? Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> Close your eyes. She prepares food. Remember, I'm a guest. Your family isn't as weird as this, though, right? I mean, you know, yeah,、uh, kind of worse in their own way. How could they be? The Republican thing. My dad's PR firm created my Facebook page. Wow. So you're not a Republican. My dad stood there while I registered, so yeah, I am. Are you an undercover Democrat? <laughs> I think I'm a kind of a kind of a radical apathetic. Dude. <laughs> I mean, they all seem like all they're selling is fear. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, but I think I can... never, I never hear one of them say anything that has to do with anything I think about. You know? Yeah, but so, like, what do you think about? Like. How unhappy most people seem to be. You looking for someone to run on ecstasy in the water supply? No, really. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of blank. You know. Yeah, but that doesn't really mean happiness. Like happiness. It doesn't. It's kind of just like an old timey word they used. I think you're wrong. I think I'm right. I thought you were left. Well, yeah, but I. Here's the thing. In all circumstances that money or male sexual satisfaction is equated with happiness, the pursuit of happiness is given great importance. But in all circumstances where pursuit of happiness has to do with human dignity, freedom to thrive, independent thought and expression, or uh, uh, an, an actual sense of fulfillment, it is ignored like a fairy tale. Feeding him. Fortune cookie says, happiness is in the next bite. Between the sheets. <laughs> Between the sheets. <laughs> Open up. She feeds him. Mm. Rice cracker, peanut butter, and carob syrup—very tra traditional in its own way, but prepared in exactly perfect proportions. If you run, you have my vote. <laughs> It sucks when there's too much syrup, right? It's like drowning French fries in ketchup. I know, right? Or putting pineapple on pizza. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I I like pineapple on pizza. Oh, gross! Power Rangers eat pineapple on pizza. Power Rangers are an agglomeration of racial stereotypes. Well, yeah. And. But. Well. Ninja Turtles definitely eat pineapple on pizza. You eat turtle food often. Close your eyes, and you will soon find out. Okay, but I'm going to munch away while you fix that. So keep in mind that it may appear that my eyes are open when they're actually closed. And it may seem like I'm feeding myself, but I'm actually feeding you. Both start fixing food for themselves. Sorry for being kind of hateful before. <laughs> That's okay. I I can kind of take it. I don't know why I do that. What do you think? I don't know. It's a scary world. Sometimes you gotta be scary back. How's that working out for you? Hey, Mister Pursuit of Happiness, you're telling me the world doesn't scare you? 
We've been in wars our entire lives. The ocean is actually dying. Global warming is going to kill us before we're 30, or suicide bombers, or the collapse of Western civilization due to viral greed or lack of enough privacy to think stupid thoughts. Unless advertising convinces us all to kill ourselves first because we're not Ken and Barbie. Come on, dude. That doesn't scare the living shit out of you? Like, when you listen to Captain Willy and the Robot Elite, or Obscura, do you think about dying oceans and suicide bombers? Pursuit of happiness, do that. You're life trolling. I'm peddling reality, snarky dude. When you listen to music you like, do you get all angry and feel all scared and stuff like that? No, duh, that's why I listen to it, to get away from all that stuff. Does it work? Yeah. Why? Because. Why? Be silent, Sherlock. When I listen to music I like, I feel something in my blood that feels like me. Yeah. But that's not real? Yeah, it's real. So? As if. Why do you give power to their world? Dude, there's only one world. Like, when I was young, you know, my dad controlled my whole life because he was like king and god and president, you know, and he knew everything. But when I got older and I really listened to him, he seemed like a complete asshole. In the world he was king of, seemed kind of funky. Funky like toenail fungus. So I started to think that, like, if I can see that, I must be somewhere else, right? Like I'm standing in some other reality or some other world, right? So why can't I live in that other world and make that the world instead of just being scared of his world, you know? Except when registering for a political party or deciding where you're going to eat dinner on your first night in town after two days on the road? Well, I just kind of thought of it this morning. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's wrong. Besides, isn't that what the boomers tried? The closest the boomers ever came to living in a brave new world was in their dreams. Only their perpetual cognitive dissonance allows them to think otherwise. <laughs> How can you say that? Who do you think created that big bundle of war and habitat destruction you're so scared of, while still thinking of themselves as the love generation and saviors of the planet? The boomers boomeranged, and as if that wasn't bad enough, then they trumped it. No, no, they changed the world. Yes, they did. They did not create an alternative world, they changed this one. After their brief but glorious period of rebellion and self-congratulation and simulated peace and love and, and absolutely incredible music, I will give them that, they bought into the American dream of streets paved with gold like no generation before them, and then they twisted this world into a shape that had never existed before. Like a hexagraphic asteroid hippoid? Like, like a shape in which the total value of an individual human being is measured solely by what that person is able to buy or what that person is able to sell. Kind of harsh, dude. That is the world I will not live in. I don't... Really? I mean, their hearts and souls Rainbow, and... They have pot. Wine, shamanic drugs, 2,000 channels, and, and big and little electronic magic boxes to assure that they never, ever, even accidentally, make contact with their hearts and souls. They would not be able to bear it. And they would not be able to bear facing the fact that the good life is neither good nor life. Or bear facing the lie that the, the purpose of technology is to make the world a better place when it's really just about making indulgence seem progressive. And they would never be able to face the fact that they have no better vision with which to bequeath their children other than let's move to another planet. I'd rather live on this planet in a different world, wouldn't you? You ever try to Cobain yourself? <laughs> like, check out? Did you? Ever? Did you? They read each other's eyes. You going to major in philosophy or in politics? Your dad was just trying to convince me to follow my nose into anthropology. But... You calling me a butt? Possibly. It depends on how far you pursue that lame humor, but... I, I think if I truly followed my nose, I'd save the college space for somebody who wants it more than I do. And just keep driving until I run out of gas. I don't think that's what he had in mind. Not to detract from the viability of your nose as a life compass, but what would you do after you ran out of gas? 
discover. Except. Honestly. Why not? I was raised to be weak. What about you? In one year, it's you in the car. I don't know. I write poetry. Hmm, also cool. Show me some. Maybe. Hey, listen, dear goddess of verse. You're gonna hear about this pretty soon, anyway. So I I want to apologize for my dad screwing your dad. Your dad screwed my dad. Is one of us the result? Your dad wanted mine to invest in some deal, which seems fitting, seeing as how your dad helped mine make a shitload of money. But the tree from which I fell, and hopefully will roll uphill from, had his lawyers draw up some letter which I had to give your dad, basically telling him to take a hike, which means some lab or something is going to have to close because I think my dad was the last resort to keep it open. So I'm 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 sorry. What lab? The Better Right Lab, or something like that. Better Right is like the name of my dad's company. What lab? I don't know. I was thinking it was a lab because your dad is a physicist and all. Did you smoke something while I was in the bathroom with Franny? My dad runs a pencil factory. But he's a physicist, right? He figured out some way to make graphite so it lasts seven percent longer or something. I don't know exactly. It was before I was born. Does that make him a physicist? I don't. What does he do? He's like a CEO or something. I don't know. It's like the fifth or seventh largest pencil manufacturer in the country. Wow. Used a pencil lately? Oh yeah, huh? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what did your dad do? What's gonna have to close? Wait, <sighs> wait. Did you call me a goddess? David enters. Two audience. So it is clear that change must be the core property of the entity that is the fundamental building block of all that is, a fluxen, if you will, continually changing identity within a spectrum that has chaos at one extreme and order at the other. Why? Because. The entity is comprised of two primal opposing forces: one that compels towards a cohesive center, the other that compels away from that center. Love and fear, if you will, seem to be the best words available in our language to comprehend the essence of these forces. And let us imagine that the nature of the fluxen at any given time is dependent on the balance of these two forces. As well as the rate and degree of change of that balance, and let us further imagine these forces drive flux and fluctuation within specific regions of the chaos form spectrum at specific frequencies and to specific degrees, endowing them with pseudo identities that make them appear and behave as discrete, stable entities. Some of which, interestingly, have. Mistakenly been named and accepted as complete, individual, and autonomous elemental particles. Using these pseudo identities, fluxons develop resonance and connect with each other,、uh, dance, if you will, arranging themselves first into simple pairings and then into larger and more complex groupings,、uh, families, tribes, communities, and nations, if you will, until they become the larger. Building blocks of energy and matter with which we are already familiar:、uh, particles, waves, atoms, rays, layer by layer, assembling themselves into all that is, as demonstrated in my model. Fuck, which still sits on the table.、Uh, Millie, come on down. We'll go ahead and eat. And will you bring my iPad down, please?、Uh, kids, please that take that thing apart and get the table set. Did you call me? He crosses to the bottom of the stairs. Grab my iPad, please. We'll go ahead and eat now. What do you want? Please bring down my iPad. Just a minute. Thank you, Franny. Dinner. You sure you don't want to wait a little more? We're we're cool. I think we've given him a pretty good chance, and I don't want to keep Millie waiting any longer. I forget to give her needs sufficient attention. Millie enters down the stairs and perhaps moves to the bar to open a new bottle. Wow, I feel so much better. Great. 
I couldn't hear you. What did you want? What? You didn't hear me ask you to bring down my iPad? I couldn't hear anything. Why is that thing still on the table? I don't know. Why is my iPad still upstairs? Am I supposed to take the bait and feel like I've done something wrong? Far be it for me to tell you what you're supposed to do. David, I cannot take any more passive-aggressive behavior this evening. Then go upstairs and get my iPad. I just came down from upstairs. Talking about passive-aggressive behavior. Fine. I will get your iPad. Thank you. As soon as you get that thing off the table. Where's Francine? I'll go get her. Kent exits. I'll go get your iPad, Dad. Thank you, honey. There's no need for you to do that. <laughs> oh, so the iPad isn't the issue. Holy shit. You keep us all waiting like peons, as though your junk pile could possibly answer any question worth asking. And then you decide it's a good time for a power trip on top of that. I'll get it. It's not a problem. Let him get his own fucking iPad. We could have been done with dinner by now if it wasn't for that scrap. We couldn't have been done with dinner because Andy wasn't here yet. Oh, so you're saying if Andy had been here, the model would have all of a sudden been magically done. Francine and Kent return. Is that what you're telling me? That you could have had that off the table an hour ago? You just don't get it, do you? No, I guess I don't. Explain it to me. Explain. Explain to me why, if you wanted a nice evening with your friend's son, why the hell you even invited Andy in the first place? If you had half a mother's instinct in you, you'd know why I invited him, and you would have called him yourself this morning to make sure he felt welcome. What the fuck? He's a little shit. Who, despite being married to a 35-year-old woman with a baby on the way, would rather yank our chains than do anything that makes life easy around here. 33? And it's because you've indulged him when he does shit like this his entire life. I do not indulge him. I try to show him respect. You've never once stood up to him, especially if it meant taking my side. If your side had ever been defensible, I would have defended it. Oh, so the fact that he's a sociopath is my fault? Just like him becoming an addict is my fault. Our son is not a sociopath. What is the matter with Everything you? Everything is my fault. His behavior has nothing to do with the fact that you were never home when he needed a father. And it's your happy hour ask the maid methodology of parenting was being there as a mother? Hey, bud, I'm the one who dragged him all over the place while you were supposedly working late three nights a week. I did more than my job as a mother. You did? You wouldn't even fucking nurse him, for Christ's sake. You're bringing up whether I nursed him? Are you insane? You wouldn't nurse him because you were worried about stretch marks. That's being a mother? That's being a mother who happened to notice stretch marks weren't in fashion in the magazines you kept in the bottom drawer of your desk. You think I would have had those magazines if you've ever been sober enough to actually be conscious when you made it to bed? That didn't seem to bother you when you were in heat. It only bothered you when I wanted something. When didn't you want something? Which is how you set it up. Everything under your control. Dispensing your largesse as long as you got sufficient blowjobs. Francine, don't you fucking cry. Are you kidding me? You've owned my entire existence since we got married. Where do you think I was when I wasn't here? I think you were fucking someone. That's where I think you were. Where I was was making enough money for you to have your new clothes and spa weekends and convertibles and hair color and maids and childcare and gurus and lunch dates and who knows what the hell else you spend it all on. And you won't even bring down a goddamn iPad from upstairs if I ask? Millie thrusts the model off the table. There's your goddamn iPad! It is far more disgusting that you can't even own who you are than that you fuck around on me in the first place. Somebody set the table! I wish I did fuck around, because you repulse me, you selfish, self-absorbed, arrogant, paranoid drunk! That's it. I'm done. Fine. I'm serious. That's it. This is the end. I cannot take another minute of this. My head is going to explode. Heads to the stairs. You used to be interesting. You used to be human. I am through. Starts up the stairs. Thank God. Get off my shoulders. Get off Rainbow's back. Get off Andy's ass. 
and goodbye. Just about time for the dear prodigal to make his entrance. If only you had jerked off one extra time into a sock. Millie exits up the stairs. David exits to the kitchen. There is the noise of kitchen cabinets slamming. An uncomfortable silence. Andy and I don't argue like that. We work very hard to avoid talking about our feelings. I'm going to go wait for him at home. I miss him. He loves me, and I love him. And it's all going to be okay. Bye, Franny. Bye, Franny. I wonder what that dessert would have been. Francine begins to exit. Her phone rings as she reaches the door. She digs in her purse, retrieves it, and looks at the incoming number. Why is my next-door neighbor calling me? Hey, Janetta. Here's Andy's voice on the other end. Oh, my God. Are you okay? No, no. Stay there. We're, we're all done anyway. Oh, it was great. We all had, like, such a good time. No, nobody minded that you were late. No. No. No, I have your phone with me. <gasps> really? What kind of surprise? <gasps> Four legs? Is it a... <gasps> oh, my God! <laughs> oh, my God! Oh, my God, I love you so much. Does she have a name? Francine waves goodbye and exits, still talking on the phone. What just happened? This is so depressing. Kent searches for a tune on his smartphone. He puts the earbuds into Rainbow's ears. She looks perplexed for a second, but then she starts to laugh. Oh, God! Oh, no! She searches on his smartphone for a moment, finds what she's looking for, and moves the earphones to his ears. He listens, then laughs loudly. She's outdone him. <laughs> oh, my God! She takes one of the earphones back. They listen and laugh loudly together. A complete release of tension. Our world, our world, our, our world, world, our, our world, world, our, our world. world. <laughs> As their chanting reaches a high level of exuberance, there is a sudden sound of a gunshot. Ah! Kent and Rainbow freeze with fear. David enters urgently, phone in hand, looks around the room, up the stairs. Time stands still. After a moment, just as David starts to slowly climb the stairs, three more gunshots shatter the air, stopping him in his tracks. Millie appears at the top of the stairs, a bag slung over her shoulders, the gun in her hand. There's a hole in Andy's mattress, and your iPad lies dead and bleeding on your nightstand. For good measure, put your phone on the floor. What? If this works like in the movies, I've got two bullets left. Put your phone on the floor. Why? Because I have a loaded gun in my hand. David puts the phone on the floor and steps away from it. Millie shoots it. One left. Pointing the gun at David. Where do you go? What? Tell me where you go, God damn it. What are you talking about? You know damn well what I'm talking about. Tell me or I swear to God I'll shoot. Where do you go? Where are you going tomorrow? And don't you dare fucking lie to me. If you tell me to the office, I am going to shoot. Who do you fuck? I don't fuck anybody. I'm ready to shoot. One, two... I go out to Fulton Highway. With who? By myself. To do what? Who do you meet? I don't meet anyone. I pull off the road and park. With with who? By myself. To, to do what? I ponder things. Look at me. Do you see me? I... Millie crosses to the bar and puts a couple of bottles of wine in her bag. I've got my poems, my toothbrush, and my vibrator. I'll be back when I need something else. Which probably means never. She stashes the gun in her purse. I guess I'll hold on to this, just in case. Rainbow, do better than me. You do better than you. To the audience. I wonder if there is somewhere between 
E equals MC squared, and God equals love. Some formula or something that explains the relationship between body and soul, between mind and heart, between who I am and what I do. Millie exits. Your mother didn't mean any of what she said. You know that, right? She just... Okay. She wasn't always like this. What about you? What about me? Were you always like this? I... Uh, what happens now? I don't know. Why? You need to know... I never cheated on her. Really? There are days I feel I'll die if I come straight to this house from work. I know you feel the same way sometimes. But I have to come home anyway. I'm sorry. Where do you go? To that little county park out there. By myself. I sit on a rock and... Look at the stars. You needed to be here. I've always let you know how much I love you. You needed to be here. David picks up a piece of the shattered model and addresses the audience. Do you realize that all disaster is, is extreme change? Change that happens too quickly or too completely for the thing that's changing to bear? And you further realize that extreme change manifests in two very opposite ways, either explosively, such as when one microwaves an egg, or implosively, such as when a souffle collapses into primal muck. It is clear, then, that it is essential that the intensity of these two primal forces are within a range of approximate equity with each other that each is necessary to bridle the other, because when they get too disproportionate, one force can overwhelm the other. Unmitigated fear, for example, can drive such extraordinary chaos that, at its most extreme, it will cause a star to explode in a supernova, whereas love, at its most extreme, can bind so tightly that it devolves into a black hole, sucking everything around it into oblivion. I'll be in the kitchen, Rainbow. David exits. Deaf dog lays in the street. Deaf dog, who do you meet? Deaf dog, what do you eat? Deaf, Deaf dog. dog. Do you want to kiss? I'd like to take it slow, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm down with that. I have issues. Me too. We are what we are. Ooh, how very existential of you. Kent chooses a song and gives an earbud to Rainbow. She laughs a little, then begins to gently cry. Kent also begins to cry. <laughs> if we held each other, would that be too fast? I think that'd probably be pretty good. Stand. Put your arms around me. Yes, ma'am. Kent and Rainbow sink into each other. We can do better than that. Can't we? End of scene. End of play. Thank you for listening to part two of Dance of the Fluxons by Drew Katzman. Now, before we go, we here at the Ashland New Place Festival want to say how much we're looking forward to welcoming you to this year's Fall Festival, where we will feature our four winning plays this October 16th through the 20th here in Ashland, Oregon. The Fall Festival is an amazing week of receptions and workshops, culminating in the reading of our four winning plays performed by incredible actors, many from the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and Southern Oregon University's theater department. Tickets are now available at ashlandnewplays.org. Also, if you're a playwright, script submissions for the 2020 Fall Festival are now open. Make sure you go to ashlandnewplays.org to find out more. Play for Keeps podcast is a production of the Ashland New Plays Festival. It's directed by James Pagliasotti. This episode was produced by me, Andy Herndon. 
with art direction by Cara Quinn Lewis and written content edited by Carol Florian. Special thanks to AMPF Artistic Director Kyle Hayden, Associate Artistic Director Jackie Apodaca, and Fall Festival host playwright Beth Kander. I'm your host, Andy Herndon. Visit us online at playforkeeps.org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Help us spread the word. Like, follow, share, and retweet. And until next time, remember, want to play? Play for keeps. Play for keeps.